I know a few of you are about done with zombies being covered in the Why You Wouldn't Survive series, but hey, the more I do, the less chance of me doing a zombie game in the future, right? This week, we discussed the Who Do You Do Do Diet Dying Light, the collaboration of a survivor team consisting of the culmination of every one-hit wonder rapper, the stereotype that Asians are good with swords, we have to sell this to Americans, so include a former NFL player, and Michonne. Yet another zombie game where the special variants remind you of Left 4 Dead, Grenade Island, the indirect sequel was 7 out of 10 to much water, the actual sequel has been sitting in purgatory with Jack Black for half a decade, the trailer had you hyped, the gameplay probably had you disappointed, all the side quests you did for the people didn't matter because they mostly all died in the end game itself. This week we are telling you why you would probably survive Dead Island's zombie apocalypse. Hide your kids, grab your wife, better get out of sight. Who do you who do, bitch? Let's go. Off the coast of Papua New Guinea is a small island called Banoi, home to resorts, ghetto slums, indigenous people, and lush jungles. And from this stark contrast of a beach paradise to less than suburban living emerged a deadly outbreak. Originating from Banoi's native inhabitants, the virus actually has real-world connections with the neurological disease known as Kuru, where the four people, or 4A, however you pronounce it, of Papua New Guinea would ritualistically cannibalize the body of their deceased villagers in order to return the life force of the deceased to the tribe. While consuming this dead body, those that ate the brain of the deceased and surrounding meat around it were prion prion particles, misfolded proteins that can have tremendous adverse effects on the brain, could be prevalent. One young villager had developed Creutzfeldt jacob disease, or CJD, a fatal degenerative brain disorder that can kill within a year's time, sometime in 1900. It was when the villagers consumed the boy's gray matter after his death that villagers of the four people would begin to contract the Kuru disease. The word Kuru being the four people's word for to shake or the laughing disease since most villagers would shake uncontrollably and laugh non-stop. And this began an outbreak that occurred in the 1920s and lasted until the 1960s when the four people halted the tradition of funerary cannibalism. The four people originally blamed a sort of curse derived from witchcraft or the anger of the deceased spirits. The symptoms during that time included loss loss of muscle control, body tremors, ataxia, mental instability, inability to swallow or even sit upright, and could lie dormant in the host's body anywhere between 5 to even 50 years. Eventually, Australian colonial law enforcement brought a halt to the cannibalistic rituals, and eventually these infected numbers would slowly decrease with the last Kuru-affected person dying in either 2005 or 2009, this disease being the inspiration and precursor to the disease that runs rampant in Dead Island, where a merger of stage two variations of Kuru and the HIV virus combined to make a much more deadly and ferocious pathogen. Pathogen HK, as they call it, is the typical zombie virus, or prion as we should say, that would infect a living human host, orangutans in some recorded cases, incubating within their bodies anywhere between a few hours to even a few days, effectively hijacking their motor functions, causing immeasurable amounts of pain, degrading the mind until it eventually kills them. But not soon after reanimating them into the generic zombie we have come to know and love or hate. They will go after any person or creature that is not infected by the disease to either cannibalize them or at least spread the infection to add to their numbers or in some cases just brutalize them to death, sometimes even brandishing some sort of weapon to add to the hurt factor, giving some sense to the zombies that they know how to use melee weapons and other deadly objects to a certain degree, but have difficulty climbing most objects to get to the survivors in high places. Some zombies do show some tactical sense outside of using weapons, as some will pretend to be dead, either lying on the ground, leaning against a surface, or floating in the water, and when a survivor gets close enough, will hastily attack them to sink their teeth in. The virus is very similar to both the green flu and Huron virus in terms of virility as well as the rate at which it can mutate certain body and gene types depending on either the host DNA structure, body type, or their environment. After full infection has occurred, a person will become an infected, where slim parts of the living consciousness could possibly still reside within the mind. 
but the innate instinct to attack others rages on in a kind of rabies-like state. At this point, the body has not been fully stricken with rigor mortis, so the appropriately titled infected can still run full sprint at a survivor to close the gap fast and assault them with a flurry of punches, kicks, and bites to subdue them and either infect them, consume them, or just kill them outright. However, they are not as durable as their walker counterparts, as their bodies are still somewhat similar to a living human, needing their vital organs to survive and prosper, which leads to the late stages of the virus. If they are allowed to technically live long enough, the virus will take its full course on the body and force it into a decaying, rotting, generic zombie state known as the walker. Basically, damage to the body is not preferable as it doesn't do too much as they slowly move at you and their greatest strengths are in numbers, but going for the head and picking them off one by one, much like any other zombie scenario, will prove to be effective. In some cases, the infected don't always turn out to become walkers and some people never become infected in the first place, turning into bulkier, deadlier, and more dangerous variants that are honestly the reason this video's title is why you would probably survive. If you're going to run into some of these guys, your chances of survival are going to shoot down, such as the Adonis and Meathead of the Hordes, the Thug, who can literally send you flying from one swing of its mighty arm. The danger lies in being within close proximity of him, as most melee weapons will require successive hits before any discernible damage or amputations occur, and if you're too close, you could have your neck snapped or a body part of yours broken. It is possible these thugs came to be due to high testosterone, <laughs> overuse of metabolic steroids, or derived from just rather large human beings. Now, much like the boomer, not every zombie should be swung at with that refrain. Pimpled up and bloated out, the suicider has the capability to explode, sending razor sharp bone shrapnel at a powerful enough blast to instantly kill anyone within a small radius of him. While out in the open and with enough warning, these guys aren't too big of a danger as you could easily hit them from afar as any kind of damage will trigger them to explode. But possibly due to high amounts of anxiety, getting close to them will make them convulse and explode as well. Even hearing them yell out, help me before killing themselves. Now, if you are within an enclosed space or narrow pathway and find yourself face to face with one and not much room to escape, you may be finding yourself a charred and riddled corpse next to a puree of zombie guts. There could be any number of reasons this zombie comes into existence, possibly due to cancerous tumors that have built up within a host. Some hulking masses were either restrained before or after infection, but regardless, these particular zombies in their bound state are not to be taken lightly as the ram can charge forward plowing through considerable defenses. While they can't bite you or slug you to death, they can more than make up for it by bowling you over and trampling you to death or of course hinder your defenses and means of escape by breaking through barricaded doors and tipping over vehicles. Their sheer bulk makes them nigh impossible to tip over by yourself, but a small opening on their back can leave them open to gunfire and strong melee hits. But it's going to take a lot to take this crazed behemoth down. A variation that puts Left 4 Dead's charger to shame, the wrestler can be seen as a thug who went through even more extensive mutations and probably throwing in some masturbation jokes, leaving one of its arms a disgusting, almost iron-like hammer, which, if it's able to slam against you, has enough sheer force to kill you on impact, and even the shockwaves from hitting the earth in front of it are enough to knock you off your feet to allow it to pound you to a bloody pulp. That Something like that, yeah, it's gonna just tenderize you. And yes, it's a it's the charger jokes. It's, it's fat, fat, fat. If a zombie stays in a body of water, like lakes, rivers, or even sewers for a prolonged period of time, their body can bloat up and absorb the water enough to where it could put the Walking Dead's whale walker to shame. The bloater's oversaturated body excretes a toxic and corrosive slime, coating its entire body as well as giving it the ability to projectile vomit this goop onto poor survivors, who can have their flesh dissolve from afar into those that aren't immune, could easily become infected if the acidic slime stays on their skin long enough or hits an open orifice. It's probably safe to say that it has something to do with maybe irritable bowel syndrome or something, something involving stomach acid that takes over the host's body. In some cases of environmental flooding or open bodies of water, some zombies before becoming floaters will become drowners, floating around aimlessly and while you approach them thinking they are dead, will flail up and attempt to drown you underwater all while biting at you. So either you'll be bitten by these deceitful buggers or be forced to sink into a watery grave once your lungs are filled to the brim with water. This, like I was saying earlier, shows that the zombies do have some tactical sense. The fact that they're floating around and pretending to be dead waiting for someone to come by shows that they have some predatory nature. Now, a cut above these weapons
wet willies, we have the long-haired, fast, and insane butcher, whose arms have been whittled down to the bone enough to where its hands are gone, leaving behind bloody stumps with sharpened arm bones protruding out that can gash open survivors and rip them to shreds. It has the same, if not faster speed, of a regular infected, but will screech loudly to attract the attention of other infected to hone in on you while it is chasing you down. The most terrifying part of this quick demon is the fact that its chemical makeup allows it to heal itself if it remains alive, meaning some damage that you could do to it may be brushed off and nullified. And it's safe to say, if you aren't immune, which I will get into later, and get nicked by this guy's sharp bonulars, you could very well enlist yourself in the zombie army. That's if your body parts have not been chopped up in the process. Being more akin to Left 4 Dead before it, some scientists adorning biohazard suits sadly couldn't keep the prion from seeping into their brains, becoming the Grenadiers, possibly either due to the virus being contained within the suit or interacting with chemicals held within their back-mounted tanks, big, whelping pustules have protruded and ripped through their biohazard suits. The Grenadier earns its name by ripping off its constantly generating pustules and chucking them at survivors, exploding in a biological mess that could either kill you, damage you, or in the very least, infect you within its very large radius. And last, and certainly not an idea from Left 4 Dead, the Screamer, not that one, the Screamer, seems to have been mutated from medical test subjects either before or during the outbreak, considering their brains are exposed and their heads are propped up by a metal head brace, possibly hinting that these poor individuals were either mental asylum patients or scientists that were experimenting on the infected and were looking into their live brain activity before all hell broke loose. Either way, this allowed the creature to amplify its vocal capabilities for some reason to where it could screech loudly enough to disorient nearby survivors, possibly deafening them and drawing in the attention of all infected in the Tri-County area. So you are facing being deaf while hordes are beginning to surround you. You are not going to be able to tell where they are coming from. So these are the variations and types of dangers that could come barreling through your homestead or leave you impaired or infect you in any number of ways. I won't go completely over all the intricacies of zombie survival, as I've done that in just about all my other why you wouldn't survive zombie scenarios, most specifically the Left 4 Dead one. But when it comes to fortifying a base and getting supplies, the zombies created by the pathogen HK will cause some major headaches. Breaking down defenses with relative ease, infecting food and water supplies by either treading through them or leaving behind bile on them or just overwhelming the masses if allowed to transpire and spread further overnight. The infected hordes could easily be dispatched by the military if, like I said earlier, nipped in the bud near the start of the outbreak. But in most cases involving pathogen HK, breakouts are placed in more isolated incidents and would most likely not reach pandemic levels. But in most cases, the highest chance you will have at survival will, well, being immune. Most, if not all, people are susceptible to the virus via direct transmission through a bite or bodily fluids. There is one countermeasure to the disease, and that is for a human to have the blood type O negative, which makes the host immune to the Karoo zombie prion. However, if they are in fact bitten by one of the infected, much like the Left 4 Dead survivors or the mother in 28 weeks later, can become non-symptomatic carriers of the virus, meaning their body is harboring the disease and can transmit it easily to others through direct contact if they do not share the same blood type. So basically, that means you can have the disease in you, but it's not going to do anything to you, but you can transmit it to others. Keep in mind that type O negative blood is harbored in approximately 6% of the world's population. But the most dangerous aspect of O negative is the fact that this is the only blood type that is completely able to be transfused into any blood recipient. So if any O negative infected with the disease donated their blood unknowingly to the Red Cross during an outbreak, thinking they are healthy, well, it is very well within the realm of possibility that new infected could unknowingly crop up in hospitals and many emergency wards during the onset of the pandemic due to the virus's initial unknown nature. Those people with the correct blood type could experience heightened strength and abilities once encountered with pathogen HK, being able to withstand onslaughts of attacks and increased proficiency with weapons and overall better survivability and strength against the zombie hordes, which could prove to be quite 
quite useful. However, there is a bit of mystery behind how pathogen HK interacts with the so-called immune. However, with how mutative the disease is, it's hard to tell from the ending of Riptide if either prolonged exposure to the infected or a direct injection of a concentrated form of the pathogen could cause the original immune to become dangerous zombies walking the earth with these capabilities, I think. Since Dead Island 2 has not even been released yet, all we can really go off on was that Xian survived and escaped Dead Island and tried to put a stop to the zombie outbreak, but during these events didn't explain much to the outcomes of her former fellow survivors. There is the case that concentrated forms of the virus could be injected into people to make them into super soldiers that could kill you in an even more brutal way, but the chances of encountering that are going to be slim unless governments adopt this disease. Governments could easily see to weaponizing this virus by pharmaceutical companies like Geofarm. Kind of sounds familiar, I'm getting kind of an umbrella feeling. Who originally created the virus under a secret organization called the Palm Garden Order, attempting a bioweapon that could spread fast and turn the infected into further threats. Although realistically speaking, if the virus would be countered in the beginning stages before variations of the infected could crop up, it could be easy to nip in the bud before it got out of hand by wiping out the zombie hordes and taking appropriate precautionary measures. However, any wishes of a cure would probably be false hopes to corral remaining survivors and or immune to either have them infected, locked up, or executed. So we're going to lie this out in layman's terms. If you are in a small rural town, an island of little defense, or anywhere devoid of swift arm response, you and those around you will probably fall victim to the virus via a patient zero implanted in the area's midst. As shown by the case studies of the islands of Benoit, Palanai, and Narapella, the zombie outbreak can spread rather fast. But as things reach the coast, the pandemic did spread on what seemed like a coastal city in California. So either an approach much like Dead Rising will occur, quarantining the city, attempting to launch search and rescue efforts to the non-infected, devising a possible cure, and when all else fails, completely firebombing or nuking the area to eradicate any chances of the disease spreading further. But I sincerely doubt pathogen HK could spread far and wide enough, even with the special types of zombies that it has. I really doubt any major countries would fall to this disease. But if you do find yourself within its spread, your chances of survival are nigh, possibly dying to the disease slowly while it takes your mind, possibly becoming a special variant like the Suicider, where your mind is still active while the whelps on your body are ready to explode, begging for death. Being immune, but being killed by the infected in a number of ways, like being sliced to pieces by the butcher, pummeled by a wrestler, or dissolved by a bloater. Having other people break into anarchy and murdering you for whatever you have. Being plan B'd by the government and incinerated, or dying slowly as you hide in a safe place without food or water. You could easily fight back against the horde, but honestly, if you're not immune, your chances are low, but still possible. If you are immune, hell, you could have some badass buffs to your physique. Who knows? And I guess we won't know since Riptide left us on such a shit cliffhanger. The only way of getting a cure to be possible is finding a patient zero, refining their DNA, and possibly making a cure. But by the end of Riptide, those ideas are kind of tossed out the window. That about wraps up this look into the scenario of an island getaway, with the only cost of admission being your health and well-being. If you like this look at the franchise stuck in purgatory, like and sub! And if you think any of my info was off or dumb or I didn't explain enough about the actual story, let me know in the comments. What should I cover next? Let me know in the future. You can support the channel in further videos by donating to my Patreon or donating during my live streams to have your name featured on this obituary, <coughs> I mean, donator list here. Zombie Sins and other fun videos are ahead, so click one of these links here to check out more of my content. And until next time, I'm Zachass, aka Wow Such Gaming. Don't forget to always stay well. Wow.